Hey, FCF, we are actually going to start on a new journey. Uh, we've been dealing with core critical truths for, gee, I don't know, probably 26 or more sessions. But anyway, um, we're going to go to the book of 2 Timothy in the New Testament. And 2 Timothy is unique for a lot of reasons, so let me kind of get right to the heart of it. Uh, 2 Timothy, of course, is written by the Apostle Paul, and he's writing to Timothy. Timothy, he has stationed in the church at Ephesus to try to, you know, straighten some things out there. But here's the, the critical point. This is Paul's last writing. When you come to 2 Timothy, it's about 67 A.D., and some things have happened. Um, Paul knows pretty much that he is facing death um, by Nero. Uh, in a message I just did this past Sunday, I mentioned that when we read the book of 1 Peter, 1 and 2 Peter, and now, of course, 2 Timothy as well, the, the historical context is very important there because on July 18th of 64 AD, the city of Rome, which was a city of a million people, even in those biblical times, a million people, it, it burned down, three quarters of it burned down, which then means you got 750,000 people homeless. And Nero was the emperor then. And of course, the displacement of people brought a lot of pressure on him. And so he turned on the Christian community that were living in Rome. There were a lot of Christians living in the city of Rome, and he blamed the fire on them. So this was the first time that the Imperial Roman Empire started to actually arrest and then put to death Christians simply because they were Christians. So that's the background, this fire. When you read the book of 1 Peter, at one point in chapter 4, verse 12, 1 Peter 4, 12 says, Don't be surprised about the fiery trial that is among you. I mean, the whole background is this fire that brought the first persecution on Christians. Now, the interesting thing about the persecution, it didn't seem to go outside of Rome. Though Rome was a huge empire, this particular persecution stayed within the city of Rome, but it was, again, a very big city, and it did it did bring a martyrdom to many, many Christians in the Colosseum, very gruesome deaths, amongst whom were Peter. Peter wrote first and second Peter, but then he too was rounded up by Nero and put to death. Legend has it crucified upside down. Well, shortly thereafter, within about a two and a half year period, Nero arrested Paul as well and had him beheaded in the arena. So this book of Second Timothy is just prior to Paul being beheaded by Nero. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about, he's writing to Timothy, who he has assigned to take over the affairs of the church of Ephesus to oversee what's going on there. And Timothy he meets back in Acts chapter 16, and he on Paul's second missionary journey, he asks Timothy to come with him and to be kind of his protege. He's going to mentor Timothy. Now, here's the interesting thing. Timothy lived in a city called Lystra. Well, on Paul's first missionary journey, he goes to this city of Lystra, and he has such effectiveness that suddenly Bedlam breaks out, and the uh, the pagan groupings of the city, uh, instigated by the Jews, they end up stoning Paul. They take him out and they stone him. If you ever would understand one of these stonings, we picture like somebody picking up little little rocks and hitting somebody. That's not the way these work. They would put you down in a pit, and then they would take these big two-handed stones and throw down on you. So. The story goes in, in Acts, um, I believe it's Acts 14 or 15, that they thought Paul was dead. They dragged him out of the pit, but he came back to life, came back to consciousness. Not only did he come back, the disciples sent him away, but then he, he came back through Lystra again and encouraged all the Christians. Then he went back to his home base in Antioch. And now a year or two later, he goes out on the second missionary journey, and that's when he takes Timothy with him. Now, I say all that to say this. Timothy and Timothy's mom and grandmom may have witnessed the Apostle Paul being stoned and then kind of coming back to life. So tuck that away. And then, then when you come to this book, Timothy and Paul now, they have, they have partnered together in ministry for the kingdom of God for 25 years. So the closeness between the two is a significant part of the letter. All right. We got the background. Let's jump right into the text. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. It says, oh, and just to let you know, I'm reading from the New Living Translation this time. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus or Messiah Jesus. I have been sent out to tell others about the life he has promised through faith in Christ Jesus. 
I'm writing to Timothy, my dear son. Now, he, he meant son, spiritually speaking. Paul evidently uh, solidified his conversion you know, to Christ and then, of course, mentored him and nurtured him uh, and so forth. May God the Father and Christ Jesus, or Messiah Jesus our Lord, give you grace, mercy, and peace. Well, let's go back and pick it apart a little bit. It says, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle. Now, Paul wants everybody to know he didn't choose this task for himself. In Acts chapter 9, you can read about the calling where the resurrected Christ revealed himself to a man named Saul of Tarsus, who was trying to uh, crush the church of Christ, persecute Christians. But when he sees that Jesus is indeed risen from the dead, he says, Lord, what would you have me to do? And he becomes the, the greatest servant of God that there, there ever has been. So Paul wants people to know, though, I didn't choose this sent out mission role on my own. An apostle means one that is sent out. Now, this doesn't mean that every missionary today is an apostle. Um, the apostles were unique in that the New Testament was still being formed, and they were recipients of the, the revelation that the Holy Spirit was giving that was going to form the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, for example, was a recipient of 13 books of the New Testament. Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians that there are certain sign gifts that the Lord gave to the apostles to designate them as the ones that were receiving the Word of God and that it was to be written down, passed on, preserved, and, and so forth. So, he wants people to know that he didn't take this on himself. He says, I've been sent out to tell others about the life he has promised through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, it's interesting. Sometimes you read through Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's Christ Jesus. When you see Christ Jesus, it's emphasizing his messianic uh, role or his messianic position. All the word Christ means is Messiah, which was the one that was promised in the Old Testament was going to give the full revelation of God and was going to, you know, restore everything to the, the order of God's truthfulness that was meant to be. Anyway, it says that Paul was sent to talk about this life that is the result of a person putting faith or trust in Christ. When we put our when we when we take the trust which is usually supremely in ourself and we transfer that trust to the Lord Jesus Christ, and instead of following my ideas and my values and my desires, because I trust in myself supremely, I start following Jesus' ideas and Jesus' truth and his value system. Now I have entered into the kingdom of God. Jesus is now my king. He says, do it, I do it. He says, stop it, I stop it. Why? Because I trust him. So this, this trust in Christ brings a new quality of life. Jesus starts to help us rid ourselves uh, of the toxic, to the things that, that are toxic in our souls, like sin of various sorts. He helps us to learn the principles of righteous love, which then um, awaken many of the, the God-given capacities that God's given us, and we start to grow. We start to become the people we were meant to become and do the things we were meant to do, to become the Christ-like version of ourselves. So all that's involved in this new life that comes as a result of somebody trusting in Christ. Verse 2, he says, I'm writing to Timothy, my dear son. Now, I've touched on that. He had this 25-year-long relationship with Timothy. He, he mentored him. He traveled with him. Timothy saw Paul go through so many things, so many sufferings, uh, including an earlier imprisonment in Rome. This is his second imprisonment in Rome. And so they had a very unique relationship. And he says, May God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace, mercy, and peace. Now, this... This grouping of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ together would have been unique to the recipients because most of the recipients, although there were many Gentiles, and a, and a Gentile was just anybody who was not a Jew, that were putting their trust in Christ, becoming his followers. Nevertheless, most of the recipients, the earliest recipients, would have been Jews. And for a Jew, they didn't even pronounce, they still don't pronounce the name of God. Uh, they so revere it. And so for the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father is the one they consider God to be side by side. This is showing equality, that God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit, they are equal. They are all e the eternal first cause. They're equal in power. They're equal in immortality. And um, But yet they're of one heart, one mind. But it's a, it's a powerful statement showing that Jesus was indeed God in flesh. And then the terms grace, mercy, and peace. Grace is God initiating 
his goodwill toward us, even when we don't care about him, even when we don't deserve it. He, he pours upon us unmerited mercy and favor. He seeks us. He reveals himself to us. He seeks to draw us to himself through his truth. His mercy, we kind of know what that is. That's that forgive us that Jesus was, was uh, often pronouncing on people before he ever went to the cross. The paralytic, for example, he said, Son, your sins are forgiven. God, God is forgiving. He just has to forgive us in a way that will effectively deter us from thinking that sin is inconsequential and then plunging headlong into it. So there's grace, there's mercy, and then there's peace. The peace results from us knowing that God loves us, he's for us, that's his mercy, he initiates seeking us, and then he forgives us, that's mercy, and that brings to us peace. I now am who I'm meant to be. I'm now in union with my creator, the place that I was always meant to live from. It says that we were created by Christ and for Christ. We are meant to live from a union with Christ. And when I live my life from that place of being united to Christ and he's influencing me all the time, well, now I'm becoming fully human and fully alive and developing the way God intends. So all, all that is, is hidden away here in just these couple little introductory verses. We'll stop for today and we'll pick it up again tomorrow. Thank you.